Let's take a look at fine tuning. So fine tuning is a way that you can actually update the foundation model that you are training. Well, you are training it while you're, while you're updating it. So now for the first time, you're actually changing the foundation model. You're creating a new model that is based on the foundation model. And that is going to be what you're going to use. Now this is more, this kind of has more cost up front than say RAG, which we've looked at before. What I mean by more cost up front is the fact that you are now, I mean in RAG, you're loading everything into the prompt that might be beneficial to it. You're searching through a body of knowledge and you are finding the chunks that are close enough to the, to the prompt that you decide to include them. The problem there is your prompt gets much, much bigger and your build as you go based on that prompt. So now you can get into fine tuning where you have to pay for training up front and that training can get quite expensive depending on how much you're actually training it, training it on. But your prompts will probably need, will now can become much, much smaller. You might not even need to use RAG. You just train it on all of the data that you have available you have to generate all of the prompts for that, and we'll see that in a moment because that's, that's one of the aspects, certainly, of this. Are you going to use some sort of a tool to take a large block of text and generate prompts for it, or are you going to very, very much fine-tune those, those prompts that you're going to train it on? So we have the prompting guide, or the fine-tuning guide, that is provided here from OpenAI. I do recommend that you take a look at this. This gives you the most up-to-date information, once it eventually loads, on, on how, to, how to do this. Oh, it's, I don't know why they do that. Uh, but it, this, is, this is a very thorough guide that tells you all of the pros and cons, how to calculate the costs, everything. I'm not going to reproduce this, this document in my others. I'm going to take you through some of the highlights of this so that we can... Um, so fine tuning can give you higher quality results than can be achieved by simple prompting. Tra prompting alone, you can't completely change the tone, so to speak, of the large language model. The example that I'm going to show you here is an example that comes from OpenAI that shows you how to, how to teach it to be sarcastic. So when you tell it, when you ask it, what is the capital of France? It will tell you, it will tell you Paris. Who doesn't know that? Or something like that. So it'll be, it changes the tone entirely. So if you're trying to do something entertainment-wise for this, like I saw, there, there's, a, there's a popular site called uh, Yolando, where they, they create all these chatbots for all different kinds of historic people and, and others. I mean, it, it, Yolando has some slightly, slightly sketchy uses out there. But the thing is, if you're, like, there's Game of Thrones characters on there. And if I want to talk to Jon Snow or I want to talk to Daenerys or one of them, they all sound basically the same. They have different knowledge that they're pulling from. But their tone, their choice of words, all of that sounds very, very similar because they're not fine-tuning it. You would truly have to take everything that Jon Snow had maybe said in the script and then you could train it on it and it really would sound a lot like, uh, like Jon Snow. So let's look at this. So some of the other things that you will want to use this for are, first of all, just style and tone, structured output. So if there's a very specific structure that you want this coming out as, not just JSON, but a very specific JSON format, fine tuning can be very good for that. You can completely fine tune it for whatever that output format that you want it to be is. Tool calling, if you want it to be calling very specific tools, very specific ways, you can fine tune that into the model as well. Also, agent use. 
uh, through function calling. If you wanted calling Python functions, you can tune it for that. Uh, and it, it'll be very effective at calling your functions to augment what it is actually doing. Now it's important to consider the cost of this because you're, you're going to deal with really two main costs. You're going to deal with a cost where just training it. So running it through all the iterations, this is all happening up on the cloud because these weights are closed. You can't just download GPT-4.0 and expect to be able to train it, nor when once you fine-tuned it, you can't download it. You don't really own it. It's sort of just held for you so that you can, you can access it. So the training, that costs money. And then when you, when you want to actually infer from it or inferencing, where you send it prompts and get your response back. <coughs> That also costs money because inferencing always does cost money, but it costs more because it's not just GPT-4 oh, that's sitting out there. It's a special variant of it. So they've got to keep your weights up in memory dealing with the inferences coming in. So it's more expensive, both training and as you use it. So certainly be aware of that. Now, there is not a cost, at least currently, for the weights that you train and you keep up there. So these new fine-tuned models that you have, you'll see that they you're not charged for those. And we'll see that when you go through the GUI, they don't even give you a way to delete them, which is a little annoying to me, but it's, it's how they work. And they're not charging you anything for them, so I guess that's the, that's the argument there. So another thing that is very important to think about is what does the... What does the structure look like for this? This is very much supervised training because you're giving it a input prompt and what you expect the output prompt to be. So here is an example of what this actually looks like. This is a JSON-L file. So JSON-L is just JSON except that it's, it's line based. So each line in your training file is is a separate JSON sequence. If you were to do this pure JSON, these would all be elements in a list, but that's not how OpenAI wants it. They want JSON L. So here you can see examples, and this comes from OpenAI. You always put in what the system prompt is, or at least what you expect the system prompt to be for this. You want to set the system prompt to something pretty similar to what you have here. Otherwise, it may or may not work because if you don't change the system prompt, it's getting contradictory information. It's the normal system prompt says, you are a helpful agent to answer questions. Helpful agent. Well, here we're saying that Merv is a factual chatbot, so tell the truth, that is also sarcastic. So it's kind of mean. What is the capital of France is what the user might ask. And then the assistant would answer Paris as if everyone doesn't know that already. Who wrote Romeo and Juliet? Oh, just some guy named William Shakespeare. Ever heard of him? Uh, how far is the moon from the earth? Around that, give or take a few, like it really matters. So that's kind of a mean chatbot. This is OpenAI's example, um, not mine. And then we talk about costs, which I already kind of kind of covered. The costs of these change a lot. And the cost of using these large language models has dropped substantially just in the last couple of years, which is all they've really been available in the cloud. So there you've got deflation going on there where basically these are getting cheaper and cheaper to use. So that's this video. We're going to continue with this in the next one where we start to make use of it through the console in the, plat the, the platform in OpenAI. And then after that, we'll see how to do this in code and continue along there. So thank you for watching this video and please subscribe so that you don't miss the rest of this class and click smash the like button if this was helpful to you. Thank you very much.